Season 4, Episode 1, Smoke. We're taken to our season-mandated Gene scene. Right after Gene totally biffed his noodle on the floor, he's taken to the hospital, where his personal records are being closely analyzed, giving Gene a bad feeling. Luckily, the doctors don't find anything out of the ordinary, and they tell Gene that the fall wasn't caused by a heart attack, so they let him leave the hospital. As he tries to check out, though, the receptionist has trouble trying to process Gene's identification. But before Gene can start shitting his britches, the receptionist realizes she made a small mistake typing into the computer, and Gene leaves the hospital. His bridge is unshitted. As Gene looks out the window like he's the Joker, Gene notices his taxi driver's air freshener for the Albuquerque Isotopes. An actual baseball team, by the way. As the driver starts to give Gene some weird looks, Gene asks the taxi driver to pull over and drop him off, and Gene bum rushes out of there, realizing that his identity may not as be as undercover as he thought. Back in the present, we're given this beautiful scene of ashes floating through the air, with the camera panning over from the Dr. Mesa Verde files to Jimmy sleeping in bed with Kim. Jimmy gets an early start to the day, feeding his goldfish and looking around the newspaper for any job offerings. He gets a call from Howard, telling him the not-so-good news about Chuck, and Jimmy rushes to the scene, with Chuck's house burnt to a crisp like a rat that fell into a KFC fryer. He sits on the bench that he and Chuck sat on during Pimento, staring at the same Transformer that Chuck did. Jimmy talks to Kim, telling her about about the electrical units that he found in Chuck's backyard, and how he believes that this, along with his death, was no accident. He tries recalling his conversation with Chuck and how normal he seemed, but forgets to mention the part where Chuck told him to go fuck himself. Mike quits his job as the toll booth operator, and he gets his first check for Madrigal, netting himself a cool 10 grand. Kim gives Jimmy a call from Howard, who goes through Chuck's obituary to check by Jimmy. Howard goes through all of Chuck's life story and major achievements, but Jimmy straight up ignores Howard and walks out of the room. Jimmy sits on the couch, depressed, and Kim pops open the Zavira and Yeho bottle to try and make him feel better. We transition to the next morning, with Kim fast asleep on the couch, but Jimmy's still sitting in the same hunched over position. One thing that I love about this show is the amount of visual storytelling on display. Kim and Jimmy go a good two minutes without even saying a word to each other, but the message is still crystal clear. I also love how the show leaves a lot to our imaginations. Jimmy goes almost the entire scene without saying a single word, and we're left to wonder what he's thinking about as he walks away from Howard's call and sits on the couch. Is he sad about Chuck's passing? Is there something that he felt that he should have done to prevent his death? Or is he simply simply trying to repress his memories. This makes re-watching the show all the more fun, because it's also possible that Jimmy thought about none of that and was actually thinking about pounding down a Nachos Bell Grande combo from Taco Bell. Fucking smash some hot sauce on that shit and go <laughs> We're taken back to the moment Hector went bye-bye on the ground. Nacho knows that Gus likely smells foul play in the air, so he tries to dispose of the evidence into a manhole cover, but is stopped by Gus, who takes him to a meeting with Bolsa. Nacho sweats his balls off during the meeting, and Bolsa tells him that the Salamanca's territory still belongs to the Salamancas for the time being. As Nacho leaves, Gus warns Bolsa of a likely move against the Salamancas, which would likely bring war, chaos, and worst of all, attention from the DEA. Nacho disposes of his pills into a nearby river, as Victor spies on him, tracking him down with a bug placed on his car. The discount version of Terrence Fletcher from Whiplash heads to work for the day, when he realizes that not only will his car not start, but his ID is missing too. Now who could have possibly done that? Oh, it was Mike. Mike dicks around the magical office, driving around on the Mike mobile and marking down all of the imperfections with the business. He gives the ID back to its rightful owner, and grills the fuck out of the manager for letting Mike just waltz on into the business without anyone giving him a second look. You got duplicate routing numbers on cargo, surveillance camera blind spots on the north and the east side of the floor. Oh, well, I'll do respect. I don't know anything about a security consultant. Well, you wouldn't, would you? Maybe you best call corporate. Try Lydia Rodart Quayle. We transition to Chuck's funeral, which is just as boring and depressing as Chuck was. During the funeral, we can hear a rendition of this song I'm still not going to attempt to pronounce, playing in the background, a reference to Cobbler's Cold Open. Many attendants at the funeral talk to Jimmy, sending their condolences, but Jimmy remains numb, seemingly void of any emotion. Howard and Rebecca grieve for Chuck's loss, as the show abruptly cuts to Jimmy and Kim driving back to their apartment. 
They spot Howard sitting on the curb, devastated, and Howard talks to the two inside, telling them that he believes that Chuck's death was intentional, since he lived without electricity for over two years, and knew damn well to be careful with the lanterns. Howard believes himself to be the cause of Chuck's death, since he was the one who pushed Chuck out of HHM in the first place. Howard also mentions Chuck's malpractice insurance premiums being raised as another key factor of him leaving the firm, and you can literally see Jimmy's heart sink as he hears of this news. Jimmy knows that he played a major role in Chuck's death, but rather than coming to terms with this knowledge, he plays an extremely dirty card. I think he did what he did because of me. Well, Howard, I guess that's your cross to bear. Oh my god, Jimmy, what the fuck? I thought the Irene thing was bad, holy shit! Jimmy is projecting more than a fucking movie theater in this scene. Rather than coming to terms with his own emotions, he instead decides to redirect them towards Howard, pinning him to be the main cause of Chuck's downfall, and represses his own guilty conscience in an effort to trick himself into believing this narrative. Douchebag. This episode is hauntingly quiet, with Chuck's death looming in everyone's heads. It's a very slow-paced and visual-heavy watch. While there are some great scenes, though, this one's still getting a B tier for me. A good start to the season. Season 4, Episode 2. Breathe. The episode begins with Hector in a hospital bed, recovering from his stroke. <laughs> Mr. Poof Poof plays with Hector's nasty fucking toes as he gathers data for Gus, telling him that Hector is no longer in a coma, but is still unresponsive. In the end, I can think of no better judgment on this man. Isn't this what he deserves? I decide what he deserves. Jimmy is up and at him early in the morning, ready to attend some job interviews. Kim asks Jimmy if he wants to take some time off, considering that Chuck is dead and stuff. But Jimmy is way too good at this whole repressing traumatic memories thing, because the thought hadn't even crossed his mind. Nacho meets his dad at work, who's over here looking like a depressed Mario brother. Nacho tries to assure his dad that Hector won't be a problem anymore, but he's way too disappointed in Nacho's actions to be relieved. He asks Nacho when he's going to quit the cartel business, and Nacho tells him that he's trying to. Jimmy almost totals his fucking car as he drives to his first job interview, and heads into the office. He talks to the owners, who show Jimmy all the stupid shit in their office. During the tour, Jimmy notices a Hummel figurine, similar to the ones that he helped Landry with in an Alpine Shepherd Boy. The interview goes very well, but the store owners tell them that they'll make their choice in a week, and since Jimmy doesn't want to spend that free time thinking about his potential responsibility for Chuck's death, he pulls a quick scheme and makes an impassioned speech. Hey guys, I know you said you'd take a week, but... Can you hire me right now so I don't have to think about my dead brother? Pretty please? This somehow works, but Jimmy immediately feels bad and takes it all back, criticizing the shop owners for taking in some random guy off the street, and he storms out of the office. Mike has a meeting with Lydia, who asks Mike why he pulled that scheme last episode. Mike tells her that he did it to add proof to the cover story, since the employees around the office now know the face behind the name that receives the check. If I asked you to reconsider... I'd ask you to do the same. At the moment. You have Gus Fring's respect. I'd want to keep that if I were you. The twins meet Hector in the hospital, and the nurse tells them about Hector's procedure to get him back on his feet. As Nacho and Stupid Ponytail Guy walk in, she recommends that they speak to Hector, in order to help Hector's brain build pathways to reconnect and improve his communication skills. They tell Hector how many hot bitches they've been fucking, and how the Salamanca's reputation is still holding up well on the street. Lydia calls Gus to tell him that Mike's going to continue acting like a dumbass, but Gus ensures her that Mike is reliable, and suggests that she not question his motives. So I'm just supposed to let him keep stealing my employees' badges. This isn't something I want to spend my time worrying about. Then I suggest you give the man a badge. Kim heads to HHM, where Rebecca and Howard deal with Chuck's estate. Howard hands Kim a personal letter from Chuck to Jimmy, along with a check that amounts to five grand, which is essentially the bare minimum for Chuck to give in order to cut Jimmy out of his will. Even beyond the grave, Chuck can't help but give Jimmy one last middle finger. Kim gets pissed at Howard, criticizing him for proposing to Jimmy his Chuck committed suicide theory on the day of his funeral. Howard apologizes, stating that he thought that he owed it to Jimmy. But Kim doesn't let this one go and continues to lay it all on Howard. Who cares what it does to Jimmy, right? As long as Howard Hamlin is okay. Kim, I, I don't think that's fair. Fair? Let's talk about fair. Hey, let's let Jimmy dig around the fire-damaged wreck where his brother died screaming! And then let's let him pick up a keepsake or two! That is so, so fair! What can I do to make it better? 
Nothing. There is nothing you can do. Just stay away. Is Reyes Seahorn a good actor? Man, poor Howard. You know for a fact that he's struggling like crazy, but instead of getting emotional support from Jimmy and Kim, he's told that Chuck's death was his fault and that he should go eat shit. Jimmy shows up with way too much food, and he and Kim decide to play Battleship as the poor goldfish is forced to watch. While watching pornography, Jimmy finds out that the Hummel figurine that he saw earlier is selling online for nearly nine grand, and he leaves Mike a message, asking if he'd like to pull another con with him. Nacho and stupid ponytail guy head to a meeting with Victor and Tyrus, and stupid ponytail guy complains that there's only five blocks of coke this time around, instead of the usual six. Victor and Tyrus tell them to eat ass, but Nacho pulls out his gun, threatening them unless they give the extra block. This threat ends up working, and Nacho and stupid ponytail guy walk out happily ever after. <laughs> I know what you've done. The Salamancas, they do not. Do you understand what I'm saying? From now on, you are mine. Beats here. Season, season, season four, episode three. Something beautiful. Oh, sweet. Time to kick off the something trilogy. The episode kicks off with Victor causing his car to eat total shit. <laughs> This wreck was an intentional setup. As Tyrus falls behind him, tossing bullets and glass out his door like a fire truck tossing candy during a parade, Nacho watches from the car as they open up the trunk, revealing the currently decomposing body of stupid ponytail guy. Instead of pulling a Walter White and just dissolving the body in a barrel, they decide to create a fake shooting that stupid ponytail guy and Nacho were supposedly involved in, in order to fool the Salamancas. Unfortunately, their plan involves a shit ton of bullets, so in order to make it realistic, Nacho allows himself to get shot. Can I make the call? Jimmy asks Mike if he wants to participate in his latest Alpine Shepherd Boy scheme, asking him to break into the office and swap the original figurine with a similar duplicate. But Mike thinks Jimmy's lame as fucking leaves. The twins investigate the definitely real crime scene, and they find Nacho dying on the ground. They take Nacho into their car, and they clean out his gunshot wounds that I'm definitely not gonna show here. Yeah, that's right. I'll show Walt's bare ass cheeks in the Breaking Bad video, but I won't show some itty bitty gunshot wounds. Anyways, the twins burn up whatever's left of the crime scene, and they drive out of there in this beautiful looking shot. Kim does some boring shit at Mesa Verde, and Kevin shows Kim a bunch of models for some potential new buildings, which she gets bored of very quickly. She asks her new paralegal Viola for a ride to the courthouse, while Jimmy meets Dr. Caldera at his office, who helps Jimmy gain access to a new partner to pull that Alpine Shepherd Boy scheme with. As Jimmy exits the office, the twins twins enter, and they ask Dr. Caldera to fix up Nacho's extremely wounded body. He fixes Nacho up for the most part, and requests them to not ask for his services ever again, since the cartel business is too hot for him to handle. Later that night, Jimmy's new contact breaks into the office, and steals the figurine. However, as it turns out, one of the store owners is the most depressed motherfucker alive, as he walks out of the bathroom and heads to his makeshift bed, forcing the robber to hide. The store owner argues with his wife, and then calls a pizza joint, and Jimmy's contact realizes that he's probably gonna be there for a while, so he calls Jimmy, begging him to pick him up. Jimmy tries setting off the store owner's car alarm, but he turns it off immediately, so Jimmy takes a more desperate measure. My favorite part about this is how he yells at the car to stop moving. The fuck did you think the car was gonna do? Listen? Jimmy's contact escapes the office, and assures Jimmy that they'll be shitting gold here soon. Bolsa calls Gus, telling him about the totally real hit on Nacho and Ponytail Guy, and tells him that this is the last straw when it comes to shipping cocaine through Mexico, advising him to look somewhere in the United States to ship meth instead, all according to Gus's plan. 
You see, Gus has his eye on a certain scientist to cook some high quality product. And you might be able to recognize him from his rap skills that surpass the likes of Eminem and MF Doom. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, astrontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Oh! <laughs> Uh, Mr. Freeze. Gale shows Gus some test samples, which peak at around 67% impurity, a far cry from the rates he'll be seeing in the future. Gale admits that these samples are poor, and offers to make better ones, but Gus tells him not to, as he doesn't want to interfere with his studies. Kim is hard at work while Jimmy slouches his fat ass around the house. Kim hands Jimmy over the letter Chuck wrote to him before he died, and Jimmy reads it aloud, completely unaffected by the emotional words put on display. I remember quite clearly the day you came home from the hospital. You can't imagine the joy on mom's face. I can honestly say I never saw her happier than she was on that day. We have not always seen eye to eye. I expect that will continue to be so in the future. However, nothing will ever change the fact that we are brothers, flesh and blood. Say what you want. A man could write a letter. Unlike Jimmy, the letter made quite the impact on Kim, and she leaves the room, crying. This final scene is incredibly interesting. I've brought it up a few times already, but Jimmy's compartmentalization and repression of his feelings toward Chuck are put on full display in this scene. Before he read the letter, Kim handed over the check for five grand, which Jimmy casually responds with, Yeah. I can pay off my MasterCard. I don't know about you, but if I got a $5,000 check from a deceased family member, douchebag or not, my first thought probably wouldn't be to immediately think about what to spend it on, let alone voice it out loud. Not only that, but as he's reading the letter, he's casually munching on a bowl of cereal, going as far as to narrate through a mouthful of Cheerios. I sincerely admire your energy and resilience. I used to worry about you finding a place in the world. This is some next-level emotional suppression. Imagine going to a family member's funeral, and you just see your uncle in the corner with a bag of Doritos. Kim's reaction is also interesting, but I think it makes a lot of sense in retrospect. I believe the reason Kim cried is because she's taken Jimmy's issues very personally, dating all the way back to her roast session of Chuck back in Season 2, due to how well her and Jimmy bond together. It's likely why she lashed out at Howard last episode, as she's projecting her frustrations with Jimmy's emotional numbness onto him instead. She probably figured that the letter would have been the breaking point for Jimmy to realize his true emotions, but instead, the severity of Jimmy's emotional repression was put on full display, deeply disappointing her. That's what I personally think anyways. There's this one theory that states that Kim was actually the one who wrote the letter, which is what invoked her reaction, which, like, no? There's a lot of very personal shit in Chuck's letter that I don't think Kim, as smart and as hot as she is, would have been able to truly replicate. Plus, Chuck's handwriting was on the letter, so you're telling me that she knew exactly how to recreate it without Jimmy getting suspicious? With a broken fucking arm? Anyways, I digress. Overall, this was a really underrated and solid episode. Great scenes throughout, especially the ending scene, of course. Solid A tier. Season 4, Episode 4. Talk. The episode begins with a flashback to a younger version of Maddie. As he watches an also younger version of Mike fill concrete into the ground, he lets Maddie write his initials on the ground, and the show hard cuts to Mike back in the therapist's office. He wanted me to talk. I talked. Back in the present, Victor adds the finishing touch to the fake shooting by having this random guy deliver the rest of the cocaine to a rival gang in order to make the Salamancas think that the drugs were stolen. Jimmy gets a call from the owner at CC Mobile, offering him a position at one of their stores. You know, as I'm writing this, I'm just now realizing how impressive it is that the show manages to go from cartel plot with drugs and murder and bloodshed Two, some asshole gets a retail job and is able to keep both plot lines equally engaging. Like, holy shit. That's like overdosing on speedball and then going to church. Anyways, Jimmy's a lazy ass and rejects the offer from CC Mobile, and Kim gives Jimmy the number of a therapist, since she knows that Jimmy's mental state at this point is majorly fucked. However, Jimmy really doesn't want to talk about his feelings, so he lies to Kim, telling her that he got a new job at CC Mobile, so he'll be too busy for that lame therapy nonsense. Jimmy adds credibility to this lie by actually getting the job at CC Mobile, calling back the owner to tell him that he's reconsidered. Meanwhile, Kim heads over to the courthouse 
house to watch some cases like an episode of Judge Judy. The actual judge of the case exchanges some weird glances at Kim, and tells the security guard to tell her to meet him in his office. Kim meets the judge after the case, and he tells her to fuck off out of his courtroom. This judge has absolutely no chill, telling Kim that she's never gonna find any once-in-a-lifetime cases, or rediscover her love for the law by lounging around in his court, and threatens to give Kim PD work if she enters the courtroom again. Kim enters the courtroom again. Anita meets Mike at the diner, who tells him that she's going to try to help Henry, a member of the group therapy, recover from losing his wife. Mike thinks that Henry is a bitch-ass liar, since his story changes slightly every time he tells it. Mike claims to Anita that Henry has a tell for when he's lying, and the two place bets on whoever's correct. Jimmy listens to sex jazz as he works at CC Mobile, and he quickly gets bored out of his mind. He asks the owner if he can be moved to a busier location, but the schedule's full, so Jimmy plays with his balls. Nacho tips off the twins about the stolen drugs, so the twins take a rational approach by killing everybody. Nacho, still wounded from last episode's injuries, rushes in to assist the twins, and gets his very first kill of the entire show on the way inside the base. Before Nacho can get a second kill in, one of the twins finishes the job, making the entire base look like a scene from The Walking Dead. Man, Nacho sucks at these first-person shooters. He got only one kill and had zero assists the entire game. Bronze rank motherfucker. Nacho tells Gus that the base has been wiped out, and Gus rewards Nacho by giving him more work. During the next meeting, Stacy talks about how she hadn't thought about Maddie all morning, and talks about her worries of forgetting about Maddie and losing the sound of his voice. Henry chimes in, talking about how he misses his fake wife, which pisses off Mike, knowing the actual heartbreak that him and Stacy feel at the mere thought of Maddie. In retaliation, Mike absolutely exposes Henry for the liar that he is. This guy was never married. That's just not true. Yeah? Okay. So I'll go to the public library, and I'll get the papers from 1997, and I'll run a search on Judy DeVore, beloved wife of Henry DeVore. Tell me I'll find her obituary. He wanted me to talk. I talked. Man, lying about being involved in a tragic event as a way to gain adoration from complete strangers? Who does this guy think he is? Steve Ran Azizi? <laughs> Nacho's dad heads to his house and notices that his door is unlocked. He walks in, calling out for intruders, and quickly realizes that it's only Nacho, sitting on the couch badly wounded. Nacho's dad almost calls the hospital, but Nacho begs him not to, asking him to recover at his house. Mike continues critiquing various magical warehouses, and he gets a call from Gus to meet him later. Jimmy heads home for the day, and... Wait, is that the Bernard MT condensed font? Oh my god, it totally is. What is it with me in discovering matching fonts in this show? Anyways, Jimmy talks to his contact from last episode, who gives him his half of the revenue, which turns out to be way more than projected. The two part ways, and the contact gives Jimmy some useful advice. We're gonna do this again. I'll find something. When you do, call the vet. Yeah? Yeah, new job, new phone. You never know who's listening. Jimmy decorates the CC Mobile store, hoping to grab the attention of a more plentiful crowd. Mike drives to the meeting with Gus, and Gus gets pissy at him for knowing that Nacho was gonna try to kill Hector. So... What now? If you gonna make a move, you better make it. But they're not gonna, are they? You brought me here because you have an ask. So why don't you stop running a game on me and just tell me about the job? A tier. Season 4, episode, episode 5. Quite a ride. In one of the most random ass cold opens in the entire show, we're taken to a flash forward to the Breaking Bad era, where Saul's desperately trying to plan his escape from Albuquerque. After Walt fucked everything up in Ozymandias, he rips open a secret compartment in his wall, and pulls out a secret box, which he stores in a briefcase along with a shitload of money. As Francesco leaves, Saul tells her to dump the shredded files into separate dumpsters, so it doesn't trace back to each other, and pays her a lot of cash for her troubles. I guess, uh, that's it. <laughs> Quite a ride, huh? <sighs> yep. Oh! 
Saul calls the vacuum repair guy, closing out the cold open. This entire sequence is so out of nowhere, yet so amazing. Both Bob Odenkirk and Tina Parker effortlessly slip back into their old personas, and the attention to detail in this one scene is insane. They not only went back to the handheld format for that maximum Breaking Bad feel, but they also went as far as to use the original 35mm cameras from Breaking Bad, instead of the digital ones that they use in Better Call Saul. You could put this scene right in the granite state, and it would fit perfectly, especially considering that Saul's wearing the same clothes that he wore in that episode as well. That's a double S tier cold open right there. But let's see what the rest of the episode has to offer before I climax. We're taken back to CC Mobile, where Jimmy's conspiracy decorations are not working. That is, until a customer finally drives by the store, and Jimmy does the magic thingies thing for good measure. Jimmy pretends to look cool in front of the customer by snapping his phone in half, connecting back to the cold open. As Jimmy starts selling burner phones as part of his new conspiracy ad campaign, Mike picks up this hooded mustache guy and brings him to the laundromat. Mike is helping Gus find just the right person to help lead the construction of the secret underground meth lab in the laundromat, and the first guy takes measurements to estimate the amount of time it'll take. He has way too much confidence in his abilities, and he tells Mike his experience of working on a super secret project undetected, thus making it no longer super secret. That took us 17 weeks. If I can do that, I can certainly do that. Thank you for your time. Pardon. Kim is having a good time doing pro bono work back in the courtroom, diverting her attention from Mesa Verde and making her rediscover her love for the law. She manages to lower this kid's sentence from a year in jail to four months probation, before heading off to a meeting with Mesa Verde. Later, Jimmy wants to watch a movie with Kim, but Kim has to catch up on all the Mesa Verde work she missed, so Jimmy decides to head back to CC Mobile. He buys a shit ton of burner phones, and starts selling them on the streets in a bomb-ass montage. After nearly getting his ass beaten by a motor motorcycle gang, he gets going home, satisfied after a night of making hard-earned cash. That is, until three pieces of shit decide that they want that cash. Hand it over. Nice try, look, I gotta go. Hey! Hey! Get it. Go, go, go. Come on, man. Kim helps Jimmy recover at the house after hearing about his mugging, and Jimmy contemplates his life choices, talking about how he used to be one of those kids, and he tells Kim that he'll be contacting the therapist that she recommended. The next day, Jimmy cleans off the store decorations, while Kim picks up one of her pro bono clients, who refuses to come out of the house. Kim eventually convinces her to come to the court, and as her client gets ready, she gets a call from Paige, who asks her to fix a document error ASAP, but Kim says no thank you and hangs up. Once she's done, she heads to the office to a very pissed off page. Let me be very clear. The mistake is not the issue here. I need to know your head is in this. You made us a promise that Mesa Verde would be your sole focus. When we need you, we need you. We're not a client you hang up on. I'm really sorry, Paige. It'll never happen again. I hope not. Mike picks up the next guy, who's a major step up for Mr. Super Secret Project. He takes the measurements by hand, doing a deep dive analysis on how the meth lab will be constructed and operated, and is a lot more honest about how long it'll take for it to be built. After secretly listening in on his analysis, Gus decides that this man, Werner Ziegler, is the man for the job, and introduces himself. Gustavo Fring. Es freut mich, ihre Bekanntschaft zu machen. I find it kind of odd that Gus introduces his face and name to Werner right then and there, considering how secretive and careful of a person he is throughout both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Like, damn, I know Werner's good and all, but like, you gotta give it time, man. You can't just go balls deep on the first date, come on! Jimmy walks into the courtroom, and he runs into none other than Howard in the bathroom, who's currently wearing the biggest it's so fucking over expression in history. He talks to Jimmy about his insomnia, and Jimmy gives Howard the number of Kim's therapist, but Howard tells him that he's already seeing someone. As Howard leaves, Jimmy rips up the number of the therapist and flushes it down the toilet, since he doesn't want to be like Howard because of how totally not cool he is. Jimmy talks with his probation officer, who confirms his community service hours and employment status. The officer asks Jimmy what he'll be doing in the future, and Jimmy tells him his intent to go back into law. Everything will be better. I'm gonna have more clients, I'm gonna win more cases, I'm gonna be a damn good lawyer, and people are gonna know about it. Okay. So, lawyer. Yeah. Lawyer. B tier. Season 4, Episode 6. 
Pinata. You know, season 4 isn't too bad so far. Personally, I think the best part of it is that we'll never have to deal with Chuck again. Ah! We're taken to a flashback to Jimmy's mailroom days, where the entire office congratulates Chuck for winning what was thought to be an unwinnable case. Jimmy makes a joke about Chuck's case, and it bombs so badly that Chuck leaves the office. Inspired by his brother's success, Jimmy sneaks into the office library and begins to study up on law, changing his life forever. Back in the present, Kim is exhausted, trying to balance both Mesa Verde work and pro bono cases. She walks into her room and notices Jimmy's notepad, containing a bunch of potential company names and logos for when he gets back into the legal business. The next morning, Kim finds out that Jimmy decided to skip his therapy session, and Kim responds with an incredibly interesting and philosophical retort. Okay. Jimmy lies to Kim, telling her that he went to therapy, but felt that it wasn't for him, stating that he just wants to move on and leave the Chuck stuff in the past. I need to be moving forward, you know? And now I got this job, and I'm kind of on a path. Just wanna give this a try. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, listen, I know you wanted me to go. You have to do what's best for you. Kim meets with Rich Schweikart and makes an offer to pass Mesa Verde over to Schweikart and Coakley. Mike and Gus head over to this Home Depot warehouse, where two houses are being kept. As part of Gus's secret meth lab operation, Gus intends to keep every person who works on the project in hiding, Manhattan Project style. Mike suggests putting in things to keep the workers entertained, so that they don't go crazy throughout the ordeal. Mike also suggests putting up security cameras, in case one of the participants tries to hit the bricks. Jimmy acts like a dirty slut and sticks his ass directly into the camera, and he gets a call from one of his former clients, who tells him that Mrs. Strauss from Alpine Shepherd Boy passed away. Jimmy reluctantly refers the client to HHM, as he mutters to himself, frustrated. He watches the ads that he made back in Season 2, memorializing her Oscar-winning performance. Kim talks to Jimmy at a restaurant, telling him the big news that she's taken a job at Schweikart and Coakley in order to lessen her workload. She also tells him about her pro bono work, saying that she's doing it because she likes to help people. No, it uh, makes a lot of sense. I have been thinking about criminal law myself lately. You know, from when I get my license back. Ha! <laughs> that would never happen. Jimmy talks to Kim about potentially maybe, I don't know, opening up another law firm with just him and her. I don't know, it'd be pretty cool, I think. But Kim tells Jimmy that Schweikart and Coakley is way better. And Jimmy tells her that he's fine with his decision as he leaves the table to shit his pants. Mike apologizes to Stacy for roasting the hell out of Henry. And Jimmy heads through the HHM office to talk to Howard. Jimmy asks why so many of the office cubicles are empty. And Howard tells him that they've had to make a ton of layoffs, citing the fact that the firm's reputation has taken a major blow. Pop quiz! Jimmy has just heard that HHM is going down the shitter, and that Howard is not doing well mentally in the slightest. Will he? A. Give Howard moral support to help him through this crisis. B. Offer to help Howard with the firm's needs. Or C. Act like a massive fucking douchebag for absolutely no reason other than to project his frustrations on some guy who doesn't even deserve it in the first place under the false narrative of trying to motivate him. Now this might be a tough question, so make sure to take your time- It's C. I just referred a client to you guys. You're welcome, by the way. And you're telling me this place is falling apart? Get your shit together, Howard. Excuse me? Oh, please. You suffer one little setback and you're gonna let your entire legacy go? You wanna save your business? You wanna save your dignity? You're gonna have to fight. You're a shitty lawyer, Howard. But you're a great salesman. So get out there and sell. Fuck you, Jimmy. Jimmy uses the nail salon to store an ass load of burner phones, as Mrs. Nguyen gets progressively more annoyed with him. Jimmy calls Dr. Caldera about piñatas, and bribes Mrs. Nguyen with a free phone to keep them in the office. Later that night, we're taken back to Hector in the hospital, as Gus sits in a chair next to his bed tormenting him. He tells him a story from his childhood, where he found a kuwadi stealing fruit off a lakuma tree that Gus had spent so long taking care of. He managed to snag the animal in a trap, but the animal managed to escape, breaking its leg and crawling underneath the house in the process. Gus says that he waited hours on end for the kuwadi to crawl from under the house, until one day, it finally came out. This time, I was ready. I caught it. It fought me. But I was stronger. The merciful thing would have been to kill it. I kept it. I believe. 
you will wake Gekator. It's interesting to see that Gus's vengeful instincts weren't something that spawned due to his hatred of the cartel, but rather something that's always been with him ever since he was a young child. What a great scene, by the way. This is definitely one of the more underrated Gus moments. The workers from Germany arrive at the Home Depot warehouse, and they all huddle together. Except Kai, who immediately takes advantage of the free beer. Werner swears to Mike, or Michael as he calls him, that the boys will start behaving once work begins. And Mike heads to the security office, telling the guards to keep an eye on Kai. Hey, that rhymes! Jimmy confronts the three assholes who stole his cash last episode, and he tries to make an offer with them, but one of them immediately pulls a knife, and Jimmy books it the fuck out of there. He tries running away, but unfortunately winds up in a dead end. Or in this case, fortunately. You should have taken the deal. You're like, the stupidest person I've ever met. Jimmy kidnaps the three idiots, and hangs them up in a warehouse filled with piñatas, and he gets the morons to spread the word that Jimmy is not someone to be trifled with, as Hugh and Mountain Man start busting the piñatas right behind them. You know what? If it's that important to you, go ahead. No, 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 please. No, no, please, please. No, 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 please, please, no. You get one warning, and that was it. Eight year. Season four, 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 episode seven. Something stupid. In our second entry of the Something Trilogy, we're treated to one of the best and most iconic montages in the entire show. Displaying an 8 month long time skip as Jimmy and Kim go about their daily lives, Kim officially moves her belongings into the offices of Schweikart and Coakley, while Jimmy continues his campaign of selling a busload of burner phones out on the streets, selling them under the name Saul Goodman. All the while, this beautiful cover of the song Something Stupid plays in the background. One thing that I love about this scene is that Kim is on the left side of the screen, while Jimmy is on the right, matching up with the female and male vocals placed in the left and right channels respectively. The show's visual storytelling is also put on max. Despite there being two different stories being told, there isn't too much information on display, to the point where it becomes overwhelming, so you're able to follow along on either side and know exactly what's happening. Near the end, we watch as Kim and Jimmy eat dinner and lay in bed together, but despite them being physically next to each other, you can feel how distant their relationship is becoming, with Kim's side of the screen fading to black, ending a truly beautiful montage. The next day, Jimmy gives Huel a house tour like he's a shitty vlog YouTuber, asking him if it would be a good place for him to practice law in. Huel thinks the house sucks and says no. If I was a lawyer, nope. Big glass high rise. 40th floor. Big glass high rise. Yeah, when I'm not on my boat. The nurse helps Hector recover from his stroke, and Hector purposefully knocks over his cup of water, so he can take a look at the other nurse's delectable level 3 ass cheeks. Kim takes Jimmy to a party at Schweikart and Coakley, and Jimmy compliments one of the partygoers on their tie, symbolizing how much he likes ties. During the party, Jimmy takes a look at Kim's office, noticing the quality of the office she works in, along with all of her personal achievements, making him ever so slightly jealous. He joins a conversation about a company vacation, and he starts pitching his own suggestions, each one progressively more expensive and flashy than the last, as he harps on the material wealth of the firm. Jimmy kills Kim and Rich's vibe, and is taken back to the house in an extremely awkward car ride. We're taken back to the Home Depot warehouse, where the workers are taken to the laundromat to continue working on the lab. Gus cooks whatever the fuck this is, and he finds out about Hector's current condition from his nurse, which is steadily improving. Gus asks the doctor if Hector is still the same person even after his stroke, and she shows him a tape of Hector being treated, including the part where Hector spilled the water to take a look at the nurse's plentiful bakery, which basically confirms to Gus that, yes, Hector is still the same person. Gus tells her that Hector doesn't need help from the nurse anymore, and we're taken back to the laundromat, where one of the workers, Casper, makes a massive fucky-wucky.
As Jimmy sells his burner phones, he's interrogated by a cop, who tells him that a drug dealer had recently been busted using one of the burner phones sold to him by Jimmy. He tells Jimmy to change his targeted demographic, but Jimmy starts arguing with him as Huel walks by, who thinks that the cop is some random guy that's about to beat Jimmy up. <laughs> He's a cop. Huel is taken in the back of the cop's car, and the cop reveals that he arrested Huel three years prior for pickpocketing, so he's not gonna let him off the hook easily. Jimmy tries to convince the cop not to send Huel to jail by promising not to sell his burner phones anymore, but the cop tells him to suck it and leaves, with Huel sitting in the back, reasonably unhappy. Mike chugs down some beer and proposes sending Kai back to Germany to Werner, which he denies. He explains how tired and restless the workers are becoming, and requests Quest some R and R for everyone on board. Huel finds out from Jimmy that he may have to serve two and a half years in prison for his stunt, and Huel says that he's gonna try and escape. Jimmy promises that he'll prevent Huel from going to jail entirely, as long as he doesn't bounce. How you gonna do that? You ain't even a lawyer. A lawyer, dude. I don't need to be a lawyer, all right? <laughs> I'm a magic man. You have a little faith in me? Jimmy heads to the offices of Shit and Cum, and he asks Kim to defend Huel, revealing to her his secret burner phone operation. Kim is fucking pissed at Jimmy for this, but Jimmy ignores her and proposes a scheme to get the officer that arrested Huel drunk on the stand without his knowledge. Kim, however, thinks a bit more rationally and takes Huel's case. Kim proves to Suzanne Erickson that Huel is being unfairly treated for his supposed crimes, to which Suzanne replies with a line that really gets under Kim's skin. And her only witness is a scumbag disbar lawyer who peddles drop phones to criminals. You don't know the whole story. All of Kim's rationality has been thrown out the window, as she begins to plan a last-minute scheme, starting out by buying a bunch of paper, pens, and markers from a nearby grocery store, closing out the episode. Despite this being the shortest episode in the entire Breaking Bad universe, it still manages to pack a ton of great scenes into its short runtime. Solid A-tier. Season 4, Episode 8, Cushada. Jimmy heads on a bus to Cushada, Louisiana, the birthplace of Huel, as he writes down various letters in his seat through the day and night. On the way there, he gets a ton of other people on the bus to help write letters for him as well. I like your passion, but uh, would you just maybe tone down the anger? Make it that you're, you're sad that you even have to write the letter. After many miles and hours worth of writing, Jimmy ends up at the Cushada post office, where he sends out his boatload of letters. Crazy 8 is promoted from guy that gets beat up to guy that still gets beat up but gets to deal drugs now. Nacho thinks that one of his customer's earrings is ugly, so he politely rips it off his ear. After a hard day's work of abusing his customers, he goes home to his Twitch streamer girlfriends to give them more crack. As he puts his money in his safe, he finds fake IDs for him and his father in case of emergency, which depresses him. Mike takes Werner and the gang to a strip club to get their weenies wet, but Werner doesn't feel like playing around a battleship right now, so he and Mike go to a regular bar instead. Werner tells Mike about his dad who used to be an electrical engineer, whose most famous contribution to the world was the Sydney Opera House. Mike asks Werner if he's ever considered having kids, but Werner tells him that his wife is enough, and talks about how much he misses her. Mike finds out that Kai had a little bit too much fun with one of the strip and Mike steps in before Kai gets sent to prison. Mike thinks that his troubles are done, but as soon as he heads back to the bar, he finds Werner showing some random people at the bar the exact blueprints of the underground meth lab on a napkin, which really starts to grind Mike's gears. Not even a few minutes outside, and eight months worth of being undercover have almost been completely blown. Jimmy sets up a trillion burner phones in his office for the future scheme, while Kim meets with Suzanne Erickson to lower Huel's sentence from 18 months in prison to a battery charge. She, along with her team, requests to postpone his trial in order to find more information about the crime. And Suzanne later asks Kim in private why she's going so hard on Huel's case. And Kim says okay and leaves. Mike yells at Werner for being a fucking moron, handing over the napkin blueprint from the night before. Don't be concerned. I said nothing. No details, no scale at all. Could be a skyscraper. Could be a box for shoes. I 
I said nothing about the construction. The judge talks to Suzanne Erickson and Kim and is not particularly pleased. Are you prosecuting Santa Claus, Your Honor? Because it looks like Miracle on 34th Street in here. I mean, look at, uh, get your hands off our hero, they say. Uh, mercy for Huel Babineau, they say. What, like I'm sending him to the electric chair? Kim tells the judge that the people of Kushada are very pissed about Huel going to jail, framing him as a lifelong hero to the area that doesn't deserve to be prosecuted for some small crime. The letters are just the beginning of Kim and Jimmy's scheme, as they also provide several phone numbers for the fictional defenders of Huel that redirect back to the burner phones in Mrs. Nguyen's office, where Jimmy and the film crew reside. Suzanne Erickson calls one of the numbers, and the makeup lady picks up, providing the address of a website for the Free Will Baptist Church that you can actually look up right now. There's a ton of really cool details to explore on the site, including photos of Huel's supposed service at Kushada, voicemail testimonies that definitely aren't the guys on the film crew, uh, this is Jake, and I, I guess I just want to say that Huel's like about the nicest person I ever met. This year my grades started to slip, and Huel tutored me by phone all the way from Albuquerque. He's like the big brother I wish I had, because let's face it, my big brother sucks. He'd never do that. And the email for choir director Dale Pratt, which you can contact at BigShotSodaPop65 at Yahoo.com. There's also a donate link at the bottom, which, if you click on it, redirects you to the Food Bank of Northwest Louisiana, which is a great touch. I'd recommend giving the site a visit. There's some funny Easter eggs to be found. Jimmy and the rest of the film crew continue taking calls from Suzanne Erickson and her team, with Jimmy pretending to be the pastor of the church, as organ music drones in the background. What did he do to gain so much devotion in Kushada? He's a bona fide hero. He's a hero? Yes, ma'am. There was a fire in the rectory, and it was during Bible study uh, at night. He burst right in, and he carried out every last one of them oldsters. Jimmy threatens Suzanne Erickson to bring a bunch of charter buses to protest Huel's case, and Suzanne Erickson realizes that this case is going to be way too much bullshit to deal with. Jimmy spies on Kim talking to Suzanne Erickson, and Kim later tells him that the case has been settled. Kim and Jimmy have hot, steamy sex to celebrate. They congratulate each other on successfully pulling the scheme, and Jimmy tells her that he's still trying to find an office for when he becomes a lawyer again. Mike gives Gus an update on the Super Lab construction, and Kim is really bored of working at Mesa Verde, displayed by by her looking at the bottle opener from all the way back in season 2. Her passion for pulling schemes with Jimmy and helping out the little guy is only stopped by the work Mesa Verde is putting on her, which is exemplified later when she visits Jimmy at a potential new office. Listen, Kim, I, I know what's on your mind. The thing that we did, I mean, it was nuts. And also, I agree, we are totally done with all that. Over and out, no more. Let's do it again. Nacho makes his way to Hector's shop, where a new employee is working in the back. Except this isn't just any employee. It's another member of the Salamanca family that Nacho has to deal with, and is easily one of the hardest obstacles he'll ever have to deal with in the entire series. Oh, hey. This is Lalo Salamanca who is already one of the most likable characters in the entire show in the first three minutes we get to meet him. He cooks Nacho some food, telling him who he is and why he's shown up to the restaurant out of the blue. What are you doing here? I'm just here to lend a helping hand, you know, make sure the business is running in order. I got a good head for numbers. Don't even worry. It's gonna be like I'm not even here. Nacho realizes how fucked he is, as the music drones in the background. Another overall great episode. This one's getting an A tier. Season 2, Episode 9. Season 4, Episode 9. Vita Zane. The episode begins with a classic slip in Kimmy Con, as she walks into the city hall of Lubbock, Texas, talking to the lady behind the counter about building plans for Mesa Verde's future branch in Lubbock. She believes that the wrong version of the plans ended up in the building by mistake, and asks to take a look at them. Kim is playing the role of an extremely stressed out single mother who's under a lot of pressure from her company, so that the lady behind the counter will act more sympathetic and help Kim along. The lady now in front of the counter looks over the plans along with Kim, but they don't find anything wrong, so they're in the clear. 
that is, until Jimmy, who's playing the role of Kim's asshole brother, walks in, asking Kim to smell her breast milk and telling her that he left her eight-month-old in the car, which turns Kim's character into a stressed-out mess. Jimmy places the breast milk on top of the Mesa Verde plans as Kim rushes over to the car to save her dying baby. As she finishes saving her baby, she comes back to the plans completely ruined, and the lady in front of the counter tells her to calm down, asking Kim to trade out the ruined plans with her own copy. Kim thanks the lady now back behind the counter, as she replaces the plans inside the unit with another set of plans for a bigger building, making the scheme a success. We watch a bunch of old fucks play poker, as Nacho and Lalo visit Hector, who's officially entered his wheelchair phase. Lalo talks to Hector, reminiscing on fond memories of the two burning down a hotel and killing the owner, because he gave them a slightly dirty look. Those goofballs. He tells Hector that he went back inside the hotel to grab a memento of this particular crime and gives it to Hector as a gift. This gift turns out to be a bell. The same bell that Hector uses throughout the rest of the show and the entirety of Breaking Bad. I'm not a huge fan of TV shows or movies giving backstory on something that doesn't really need it in the first place, but I actually really like this addition because the bell is such an iconic part of Hector's character. Like, when Hector's introduced in the Breaking Bad for the first time, the bell is just a weird quirk that he has for no particular reason. But with this new context in mind, it makes the feature make a lot more sense. Lalo tells Nacho to fuck off and get some jello, as Hector has some fun going ding a ling a ling a ling a ling a ling on his new bell. Same old Hector, just wants to kill everybody. <laughs> Wait, what? Jimmy talks about how sick that last scheme was, and tells Kim that he wants to include more schemes in the future. As part of his return into the world of law, Kim says that she only wants to use her scheming powers for good, a statement that will age very well two videos from now. And we're taken back to the laundromat, where Kai and Werner are setting up an explosion of a rock blocking the way of their progress, which is labeled Vitazane, German for see you later. They have trouble with some of the wiring, and Werner nervously goes down and fixes them, telling himself to pull himself together, idiot. Luckily, Werner doesn't blow himself up, and the explosion is a certified banger. God, that joke was so fucking funny. The boys have a boatload of beer to celebrate, and even Mike gets a piece of the action as well. Everyone is happy, except for Werner, who's sitting on a couch all depressed and shit. Mike asks Werner what's wrong, and Werner tells him that he misses his wife. Werner says that Kai should supervise the crew so he can go back to Germany and fuck his wife, to which Mike tells him no, but promising to let Werner call her tomorrow. While Gus plays Sudoku, Lyle bursts into his office, warning him of a suspicious looking guy in the restaurant. He fears another, I need to see your ball situation, but Gus assures him it's all good man and walks over to the table, where Nacho and Lalo are seated. Lalo talks about how awesome the chicken is, and subtly intimidates Gus into talking with him in his office. Is there anything else I can do for you? Is there any chance, and I know the answer is probably no, but is it possible for me to meet the owner? I am the owner. Really? How lucky for me. Would you be interested in franchising because I would be eager to invest? Well, perhaps we should go to my office where we can discuss it further. Excellent. Don't waste that. Gus looks at Nacho like a dog that just took a shit on the carpet, and Lalo thanks Gus for saving Hector's life, while also asking if he thinks Don Eladio secretly enjoys the conflict between the Salamancas and Gus. Gus assures Lalo that there isn't any bad blood in the first place, and that he's satisfied with the current plan between him and the Salamancas. Lalo walks out, once again thanking Gus for his last minute CPR, and Gus's fake-ass smile fades away as Lalo walks out the door. Lalo decides that he wants to do a little more pro in the Gus's business, and asks Nacho to give him a ride around town. So you pick up six keys a week? Yeah. Where? He's got a chicken farm way out of town. Show me. After many months of waiting, Jimmy heads to the hearing to reinstate his law license. Everything seems to go well, and the board members let him out with a sticker on a lollipop. However, as Jimmy leaves the room, he has a regretful look in his eye, as if there was something, or someone, that he forgot to mention. 
as one of the board members leaves the room. Jimmy asks what decision they made, and the board member responds with nothing but silence. Jimmy desperately tracks down one of the other members, asking him what he did wrong, and he tells Jimmy that they found his response as insincere. Jimmy goes way way goo goo gaga and throws his briefcase against the wall. Mike asks the security guards how everybody's doing in the lab, and they tell him that Werner has been talking to his wife for quite a while. As Werner hangs up, he walks back to his room, taking a good look at the security cameras that hang above him. Kim has some gifts to congratulate Jimmy, including an improved coffee mug and a briefcase with his initials on the front, until she receives a really pissed off phone call from Jimmy, telling her to meet him at the parking lot. Jimmy does some Mario Kart trips on his way up to the top, and he storms out of his car, yelling about the board members giving him a hard pass. Kim asks Jimmy to calm down and recount the story, and Jimmy tells her about all the questions they asked, including one where they asked him what the law meant to him. Jimmy claims that he nailed this answer, and Kim is confused, asking him what they said when he talked about Chuck, and Jimmy asks Kim what Chuck had to do with anything, and the pieces start to click in Kim's head. Kim promises that she'll help Jimmy appeal, but Jimmy believes that Kim thinks that he wasn't sincere, and starts to bombard Kim with allegations of her own insincerity. You don't believe me. Of course I do. Oh, Jesus, it's right there on your face. You think I'm some kind of lowlife, some kind of asshole. What? Kind of lawyer guilty people hire, right? I never said that. Yeah, but you thought it. Man, Jimmy really let that quote live in his head rent-free, didn't he? You're the kind of lawyer guilty people hire. Kim spells it out for Jimmy, telling him that the committee didn't hire him because he didn't mention Chuck once. But Jimmy still doesn't understand what's the big deal about mentioning his brother who committed suicide, reaching insane levels of repression. Jimmy says that Kim's attitude is the reason that they don't have an office together, claiming that Kim only loves the idea of him rather than his actual person. But Kim claps the fuck back at Jimmy, telling him that she would drop anything in order to get him out of whatever mess he's put himself in. Who comes running when you call? Who cleans up your messes? I have a job, but I drop everything for you. Every single time you confess to a felony on tape, I'm there. You have a bar hearing, I represent you. Over and over again, if you need me, I'm there. And maybe next time you call, I won't come. There you go. Kick him in when he's down. Jimmy, you are always down. This is easily one of the best scenes in all of season 4, top 3 at least. The acting needs no comment, you already know it's amazing. But what makes this scene especially great is just how much buildup there is to it. A majority of the first half of season 4 deals with the enormous shockwave that is Chuck's death, showing multiple scenes of Jimmy compartmentalizing and repressing his feelings towards it. These scenes eventually lead up to the day that Jimmy can renew his license, and by that point, Chuck is so far away from Jimmy's mind that he didn't even consider the importance of mentioning Chuck, and even when he's explicitly reminded of him, he doesn't understand why he should mention him at all. We're also reminded of small but very important events that happened in earlier seasons, some going as far back as season 1, such as Betsy telling Jimmy that he's the kind of lawyer guilty people hire, as well as the high-rise Jimmy wanted to work with Kim in. It's clear that these events, along with many others, had a detrimental impact on Jimmy, so rewatching past episodes with this context in mind makes them incredibly interesting. The same applies for Kim as well, as she brings up the many schemes that her and Jimmy pull to get him out of his many mistakes. That Jimmy you're always down line is the hardest hitting of all though, because, well... He is. Kim carries Jimmy more than I carry my teammates in Siege. This kind of goes back to what I was talking about last season, with Kim being an amazing character and stuff. She not only goes out of her way to help Jimmy, even if she's dealing with a massive amount of work herself, but she also very rarely articulates her frustrations. So seeing her tell Jimmy to his face how much of a pain in the ass he can be is very cathartic. Still a big word. So yeah, unsurprisingly, I kind of like the scene a little bit, it's okay. Kim and Jimmy awkwardly arrive back at the apartment, feeling more distant than ever, displayed by this really cool shot of Kim and Jimmy on opposite sides of the screen, until it's revealed that Jimmy's side is a mirror, showing his reflection. The two are on the exact same side of the apartment, and yet they feel incredibly distant. Kim walks into the room, and Jimmy admits his mistakes, saying that he messed it all up. You still want to be a lawyer? Well, we can start with that. 
Mike heads to the Home Depot warehouse with a handful of big bees and notices that one of the security cameras has a couple of dead pixels. The guards tell him that there was a voltage spike hours earlier, and Mike worryingly asks them to check on the outside cameras. Surprise, surprise, these ones also have dead pixels. Mike and the guards check in on the Home Depot warehouse, where he finds that Werner is nowhere to be found. They check outside the building, and Mike finds a laser pointer on the ground, which he figures out was used to kill the cameras. This was a fantastic penultimate episode. A lot of standout scenes in this one, especially the argument on the parking lot. S tier for sure. Season 4, Episode 10. Winner. Just like Crawl Space, this episode was my all-time favorite in Better Call Saul on my first watch. Let's see if that notion holds up upon second viewing. The episode begins with a flashback to Jimmy being admitted into the New Mexico bar. The HHM employees sing karaoke to celebrate, with Ernesto absolutely killing it on the mic. <laughs> As Jimmy gets drunk with Kim, he notices that Chuck is ready to leave, and he convinces him to stay to watch his performance of The Winner Takes It All by ABBA, which is equally as amazing as Ernesto. I don't want to talk about things we've gone through, though it's hurting me. Jimmy forces Chuck to come on stage, and in an extremely rare moment, Chuck and Jimmy manage to get along and sing together. Chuck eventually upstages Jimmy and sings an unironically pretty beautiful rendition of the song. I play by the rules. The gods may throw the dice. Their minds as cold as ice. Before the scene is cut off by Chuck helping Jimmy stumble into his apartment, Jimmy drunkenly rambles about how they should add a second M to the HHM name. As Chuck sets him to bed, Chuck turns off the lights, but as he's about to leave, he decides to look over Jimmy for the night, sleeping next to him. Jimmy starts singing The Winner Takes It All, and Chuck joins along with him. I was in your arms, thinking I belonged there. I figured it was it made sense. Building me a fence. Building me a home. Words cannot describe the brilliance of this scene. As I said before, a huge part of season four deals with the shockwave of Chuck's death. You can practically feel his shadow, not just throughout the season, but the rest of the show as a whole. There was not a single scene throughout the entire show where Jimmy and Chuck actually had fun together and bonded with one another. Sure, there were scenes where they put aside their differences and worked together, but never did Better Call Saul show them truly enjoying each other's company. So the entire time, you're left to question whether there was even a moment where Chuck and Jimmy equally loved each other. And then the show hits you with an answer. Yes, there was a moment where Chuck and Jimmy loved each other, one where Chuck was able to put aside his differences and appreciate the respect Jimmy upheld for him. We've spent the past four seasons growing to despise Chuck and root for his downfall, and then this one scene comes in and makes you realize the broader picture of their relationship. It doesn't undo the fact that Chuck was a massive prick, but it certainly makes you realize that Jimmy's love for his brother may have been mutual after all, even if extremely rare. God, this scene is so good. And this is just the first scene. Let's get this show on the road. We're taken back to Mike finding out that Werner Ding Dong ditched the Home Depot warehouse, and he initiates a search with a security team. As the team heads off, Mike calls a money wiring agency pretending to be Werner in order to find the closest branch in Albuquerque. We're taken to the gravestone of Chuck, as Jimmy pretends to act sad and mourn his loss. God bless. Bless you. Very thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> In order to add authenticity to Jimmy's future appeal to the court, Jimmy and Kim have planned a scheme, with the end goal of painting Jimmy as heartbroken and impacted by Chuck's loss, which we'll be seeing the full extent of later. Wallow spies on Gus's business, and he notices Gus and the security team driving off to find Werner, so he decides to follow along. Mike heads to Travel Wire, asking if they've seen Werner Ziegler anywhere. He pretends to be a family member of his, so that the guy behind the counter... Fred, will give out information. Fred eventually gives in, telling Mike that he did see Werner, but that he left an hour ago. Fred lets Mike take a look at the security footage, revealing that Werner made a few calls before heading off in a taxi, 
Part of the building blocked out the license plate, though. So Mike is fucked. He hands Gus over the transcript of his calls, where Mike tells him that Werner only wants to see his wife for a few days, and that he won't be contacting law enforcement. He tries his best to convince Gus not to do any harm to Werner, telling him that the team is screwed without his leadership, and makes a deal with Gus to not do any harm to Werner, as long as he can find him. Mike calls the team to tell them to get on this shit, and Mike realizes that Werner likely went on vacation, so he picks up some brochures from Travel Wire, and calls the numbers to find Werner, with Lalo spying on him him all the while. Howard makes a vlog for his Fortnite Let's Play channel, telling his subscribers about the Charles McGill reading room that was paid for by Jimmy. Word starts to spread about this act of kindness, as Jimmy complains about how he spent 23 grand for the room. Mike continues to call the numbers off the brochures, until he notices that he's getting tailed by Lalo. Mike reaches for his gun. Whoops, sorry, I made a typo. He reaches for his gum, popping a stick into his mouth as he pulls into a parking lot. He puts his chewed up wad of gum into a wrapper, and pulls out in front of this dude with a slushy. As Mike exits the parking lot, he inserts the wrapper into the slot, gumming up the machine. <laughs> I am on a roll! Mr. Slushy has trouble putting his ticket into the machine, and Lalo politely tells him to move out of the way. Unfortunately, Lalo is too late to catch Mike, and boy is he pissed. Jimmy stares at an ugly-ass painting of Chuck as he participates in a panel, reviewing candidates for an HHM scholarship in place of Chuck. The first applicant is Duncan, who has some very interesting words to say. Duncan's delegation was selected to visit the real UN in New York City. Duncan, what can you tell us about that? Oh, it was- This is Marcy Ramirez? Damn, that was deep. Imagine memorizing a huge monologue for one of the biggest TV shows of all time, and then the editor's like, <laughs> Nope. All of the participants get a decent amount of votes, except for one, Christy Esposito, who only got one, which was from Jimmy. The reason Christy only got one vote was because she was busted for shoplifting, which everyone except Jimmy finds to make her an untrustworthy applicant. Jimmy tries his best to convince the rest of the members that her one count of shoplifting doesn't negate her accomplishments, and that she has a lot of potential, but unfortunately, nobody's buying it even after a second vote. Jimmy tracks down Christy, and tells her up front that she's not getting the scholarship. Jimmy then begins to project all of his problems onto Christy like crazy, under the guise of motivating her. You made a mistake, and they are never forgetting it. As far as they're concerned, your mistake is just, that's who you are. I mean, they'll smile at you, they'll pat you on the head, but they are never, ever letting you in. But listen, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, because you don't need them. They're on the 35th floor, you're gonna be on the 50th floor. You're gonna be looking down on them. And the higher you rise, the more they're gonna hate you. Good, good, you rub their noses in it. Remember, the winner takes it all. Jimmy obviously sees a lot of himself in Christy, not only on account of her shoplifting and being judged for her past mistakes, but also due to the fact that she has a lot of involvement in elder work. It's almost like Jimmy is trying to motivate himself in the mirror, with how much of Jimmy's projections line up with his actual problems. For God's sake, he even references Chuck's infamous monologue at the end of Lantern. You make them suffer, because you don't matter all that much to them. So what? I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the truth is, You've never mattered all that much to me. After his speech, Jimmy walks to his car, which refuses to start. Lalo heads into the same travel wire that Mike checked into, and asks Fred if he can also take a look at the security footage, which Fred denies. Lalo doesn't feel like getting denied today, though, so he busts his way through the ceiling and kills Fred on the spot. Lalo looks back through the security tapes, and watches Mike take the brochures off the shelf, which gives Lalo an idea. As Werner jerks off at a resort, he receives a call from Lalo, who claims to be calling on behalf of Gus, in order to receive top-secret info about the Superlab's construction. Werner yaps on and on, until Mike eventually intercepts the call. I'm sorry, I didn't get that last part. Could you repeat that? Mr. Ziegler. Michael. Is that you? 
I'm so sorry if Get I... dressed. Mike takes Werner out in the middle of nowhere and calls Gus, telling him that he found Werner and that he was giving information to a certain individual. Gus immediately pinpoints this certain individual to be Lalo and orders Mike to kill Werner. Mike sadly looks upon Werner as he desperately tries to tell Mike what his endgame was. He tries to ask Mike to let him talk to Gus, but Mike tells him that there's nothing he can do to change anybody's minds, and Werner slowly begins to realize the severity of his situation. He tries promising Mike that he won't speak a word of the operation, but Mike has already made up his mind, and tells Werner to call his wife to go back to Germany. Werner calls his wife, and his final conversation with her ends in a desperate argument with Werner telling her that he doesn't want to see her again. Werner was told that she was being followed, so his argument was solely to protect her. But God, going out knowing that the last thing you told your wife was that you never want to see her again, is fucking brutal. Werner cries to himself, asking Mike if there really is no other way out. Is there no other way, truly? There are so many stars visible in New Mexico. I will walk out there to get a better look. In a genuinely beautiful shot, Mike kills Werner as he looks upon the stars in the sky. After plenty of preparation, Jimmy and Kim finally head to the courtroom to make the appeal to the board. Jimmy decides not to write a speech, and instead lets Chuck's letter do the talking for him. However, as he reads out the letter, he stops writing his tracks, and puts it away. He admits that the letter was meant for only him and Chuck, and he goes on an impassioned impromptu speech about Chuck, talking about how, while he loved Jimmy as a brother, he did not love him as a lawyer. Big reason I became a lawyer was Chuck. He was the most brilliant man I ever knew, and all my life I wanted to make him proud, and he was not an easy man to make proud, and he let you know it too. Could be a real son of a bitch. Chuck was the one who was always right, and usually he was, you know, so for a guy like me to live up to the standards of Charles McGill, <laughs> Jimmy admits that he'll never be as loved, respected, or as good as his brother, but that he can try his best to do so. I'll never be as good as Chuck, but I can try. If you decide and I get to be a lawyer, I'll do everything in my power to be worthy of the name McGill. Jimmy moves the entire court to tears, including Kim herself, guaranteeing his reinstatement. Jimmy and Kim celebrate down the hall, but as it turns out, the two are excited for completely different reasons. They, they, they have to reinstate you, know, uh, right? yeah. Did to. you see those suckers? That one asshole was crying. He had actual tears. Jesus, Kim. I just went off on this flow, you know? I had this energy going through me. It was like improv or jazz, and then boom, I sunk the hook in. Kim's excitement fizzles out, as she realizes that the speech was merely an insincere performance put on by Jimmy. While Jimmy claimed that he wanted to be worthy of the name McGill, he surprises Kim by asking for a DBA, since he won't be practicing under the name Jimmy McGill anymore. Wait, Jimmy, Jimmy, what? It's all good, man. This ending scene is nothing short of amazing. The first time I saw this, I felt nearly the exact same emotions that Kim felt, in part to Bob Odenkirk's God-tier performance. I felt moved and taken aback, thinking that Jimmy had finally come to his senses about his true emotions towards Chuck. In a way, it kind of felt like the entire episode was building towards Jimmy finally realizing his true emotions, but then the ending just slaps you in the face with a cold, hard reality. It wasn't Jimmy McGill giving the speech, nor was it Slip and Jimmy. It was so good, man. By the way, nothing will ever top the amount of actual shock I got from this episode's ending. Like, this was the moment when I realized that this show might actually be better than Breaking Bad. Because this episode is nothing short of brilliant. With an entire season's worth of build-up, this episode fires on all cylinders, and delivers a powerhouse of a finale. It's a shockingly fast-paced episode, and the whole cat-and-mouse game with Mike and Werner, within another cat-and-mouse game with Lalo and Mike, gives off a lot of vibes from another certain season 4 finale. Speaking of Lalo, 
Hello. His intimidating nature really starts to come into play in this episode. Like, he's no longer the goofball guy that makes tacos. He's the dude that'll crawl through your ceiling and shoot you in the nuts if you don't give him what he wants. There are so many standout scenes in this one episode. From Mike's gum scheme in the parking lot, to Mike's gun scheme with Werner, to the beginning and ending sequences. Man, the title of this episode is no lie. This one really is the winner. To the shock and surprise of a grand total of no one, this episode is getting a double S tier. An unbelievable end to a great season. In the grand scheme of things, Season 4 of Better Call Saul is a great season, but not the best season of the show. There are no doubt some incredible, standout, series-defining moments, but a lot of those moments are sandwiched between what are only pretty good episodes at the end of the day. Like, Quite a Ride's Cold Open is amazing, but the rest of the episode is just okay. That's probably why there are so many A-tiers. A lot of the episodes are okay overall, but a lot of them have that scene that forces me to give it a higher ranking. But the episodes that do shine, shine harder than the rest, even harder than some in the later seasons. The obvious standout, of course, is Winner. I can safely say for a fact that this is still my all-time favorite Better Call Saul episode, right up there with Crawl Space. The thing is, though, there are still two seasons left for me to cover, so it's likely that my opinions will change. But that's gonna be a tough order to follow, considering how absolutely amazing Winner really is. However, there's only one way to find out, and that way is where I will see you all next time. Take care.